Today we're going to talk about the clinical significance of vitamin D. What is it? How do we get it? What does it affect? And how much should we take? Okay, before I get started, I'd like you to go ahead and share and like the page to your friends and family so they can understand what vitamin D can do for their health. Okay? So, the clinical significance of vitamin D. Or, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. There are three others, vitamin E, K, and A. Okay? Cold calciferol, which is a vitamin, which is also a pro-hormone. So when they talk about vitamin D, this is what we're talking about, right there. So vitamin D is taken in through sunlight. It impacts the skin, gets absorbed, gets converted, goes to the liver, gets converted, goes to the kidney, and then gets converted to an active form of vitamin D, right? So the vitamin D you get through sunlight, through skin exposure. You can also get it from diet, from oily or fatty fish, egg yolk, red meat, liver, and some plant-based uh, foods, right? However, most of it is coming from uh, these types of sources. Now, the vitamin D has receptors in many different tissues. Gastrointestinal tract, bone, breast tissue, prostate tissue, lymphocytes. So let me stop on lymphocytes. When we say lymphocytes, we're talking about white blood cells. And white blood cells can be broken down into different components. So white blood cells can be broken down into neutrophils, which fights bacterial infections. Lymphocytes fights viral infections. So let me stop right there. Lymphocytes fights viral infections and vitamin D can impact lymphocytes. So there are a lot of viruses going on, right? Things like influenza, colds, COVID. COVID impacts the lungs in a lot of patients. So if we improve the function of the lymphocytes by taking vitamin D, you could lessen the symptoms or prevent uh, impact to the lungs when you get things like influenza and COVID. So it's very important to improve lymphocyte function and vitamin D is an important factor for that. Now protection against, okay, what that means is you need vitamin D to prevent things like, or help prevent things like uh, diabetes mellitus or DM, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, depression, cancer, autoimmune disease, right? It has a very global effect. So taking one nutrient could be quite beneficial to the overall health of the individuals, right? Now, most vitamin, uh, fat soluble vitamins work synergistically. So there are uh, companies that will produce all of these in a combination, right? But we're talking about just vitamin D today. So when we look at it and look at how we can explain vitamin D, because it has such a global effect, right? So there are two forms right here, vitamin D2 and vitamin D3, ergocalciferol and colocalciferol. This is from plants and it's prescribed. So when you have come in and you have low vitamin D, or you go to your primary care physician and you have low vitamin D, below, let's say, the number of 30. They will prescribe you 50,000 international units of vitamin D per week. And they'll put you on for maybe four weeks, six weeks, etc. And that's it. They increase the numbers and that's it. Vitamin D3 comes from sunlight. Right? So it impacts the skin, I guess, and then it goes through the liver and through the kidneys to make it an active form. However, you can get vitamin D3 over the counter or through nutrition shops, etc. Right? Here's the kicker. This one is prescribed, D2 is prescribed, but D3 you can get over the counter. However, D3, the colocalciferol, is actually more bioavailable and it's more utilized within the body. 
So it's better to take actually vitamin D3 that you can buy from nutrition shops, right? Rather than take T, uh, take, uh, D2, uh, which is prescribed, right? So in terms of testing, how do we test a patient and determine if they're deficient in vitamin D? There are two tests. One is called 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the inactive form. The other one is 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form, right? We typically check the 25-hydroxy vitamin D because it's the most abundant in the blood and it's also, uh, the half-life is a little bit longer. So um, check vitamin D, uh, D3 by using 25-hydroxy vitamin D, okay? Now, I said this is inactive and this is active. How do we convert it? Right? If we take vitamin D, how do we convert into the active form? It's probably through the kidneys, right? The kidneys has a big function in that. But it also occurs in lymph nodes, which is part of your immune system, alveolar macrophages, which is the immune system of the lungs, and alveoli, right? So the conversion of inactive to active forms of vitamin D can occur in these tissues. But take note right here. Those are lung right, um, cells, right? If you have lung cells that are responsible for taking vitamin D, inactive forms to active forms, think about it. If you take vitamin D, your lungs are healthier. Therefore, it can fight off infections into the lung. Right? Let me say that again. If you take vitamin D, you can impact the immune system of the lungs and the oxygenation and carbon dioxide uh, removal. So it's very important for things like COVID, right, or influenza or viruses, right, or pneumonia. It's very important. Now, what can negatively impact vitamin D or negatively impact the absorption of vitamin D? GI dysfunction, right? Gastrointestinal dysfunction. Age. As we age, our kidney function may not be as good. Our lung function may not be as good. So it can impact the conversion. Skin type, right? Darker skin tends to absorb less of the uh, UVBs. So skin type. Where you live, location, right? If you live in Florida versus here in the Northeast, your uh, sun exposure is going to be different. And also the angle of the sun hitting you is going to be different. Therefore, your vitamin D levels can be impacted. Bile. If you have your gallbladder removed or, or you have liver dysfunction, right? And you don't have enough bile, it's going to impact the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. In this case, vitamin D. Insulin resistance, metabolic issues, autoimmune disease will suck up your vitamin D. And there's another um, a little talked about case of polymorphisms where you have vitamin D receptor issues, right? Because of genetic problems. So there's a polymorphism issue, right? So we look at this and we say, hmm, we know we need vitamin D to impact our overall health, right? what is the proper level, right? What is the uh, recommended dosages, etc. It's very important to understand this portion of it. So let me go ahead and erase this real quick here. So the Institute for Medicine recommends 600 to 800 units of vitamin D, right? And the Endocrine Society recommends 1,000 to 2,000 international units of vitamin D per day. Okay, this is per day, okay? And the lab ranges, when they check for blood, okay, you're checking 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and we like that level, uh, the labs will say you need between 30 and 100 and grams per day. Okay, so this is the target range right in here, in the labs. 
Now, if a patient comes in and their number is, let's say, 11, in order for us to get this number up above 30, right, if we took 600 IUs per day, it'll take forever, right? Or may not even move or budge if they have other conditions. If we took one to 2,000 connectional units, it will take a long time for you to get it within normal ranges. So here lies the problem. Our recommendations, right, through these medical societies are completely incorrect. It's wrong, right? In order for you to get the right levels or to the, get the target levels that we want, in our office, we like target levels of between 60 and 80, okay? In order for us for, to go from 11 up to, let's say, 60, this will never make it there, especially here in the Northeast, okay? So our recommendation in our, my office, after we test, so after have to stress this, after we test the patient and we know the numbers, right? And let's say that patient comes in with an 11 on their blood test. I will prescribe 10,000 international units per day for four to six weeks. And then, we have to recheck, right? So basically, if you do 10,000 units per day, that's 70,000 units per week, and you do it for at least four to six weeks, and recheck to see if these numbers will go up to the 60 to 80 that I would like to recommend. And it'll take time, but in four to six weeks is much better than taking forever. To get there or never getting there so once we get to that ideal number that we want we will recheck and then put patients on a maintenance dosage and the maintenance dosage might be 4,000 to 5,000 international units but again after they're on a maintenance dose for a while you need to recheck to make sure you're prescribing the right amount so the importance of all this is that not everyone is going to absorb vitamin D the same way, and not everyone's gonna utilize it the same way. So if you wanna be accurate with dosing, you need to be tested, right? But really these numbers will never move those numbers the way you want. And 10,000 units or even 20,000 units per day if you wanna get it up faster, and it can be done, but with proper testing. It's very important for you to do that, okay? I've made many videos on vitamin D. Today I'm going to make one about the clinical signs of vitamin D deficiency. And the reason I'm making this video is because I get requests about how much vitamin D should they take if they don't have access to testing. So in some countries it's very expensive and in some places in the United States your doctor won't prescribe uh, the testing. So let's go into the clinical signs and symptoms and the exact dosages that I would recommend to be on the safe side while maintaining a healthy level of vitamin D. So let's get right into it. Now, to start with, I am a proponent of testing, especially if you're taking high doses of vitamin D, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 units. You wanna be able to monitor that if you're taking it for months on end. The test is 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is the inactive form. Ideally, we want it between 60 and 80 nanograms per milliliter. You can also check for 125 hydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form of vitamin D. And I made a separate video on that about how if your vitamin D levels don't go up while taking high doses of vitamin D, you can suspect there's a polymorphism there or malabsorption issues where your uh, active form is very, very high and your inactive form doesn't go up. Now, what are the clinical signs and symptoms? Frequent illnesses. Get sick all the time, right? I catch everything the kids bring home. This is a sign because vitamin D is an important immune modulator. It's very important for Th3 systems. 
Vitamin D also creates fatigue, lower back pain, general sadness or low mood. This is impacting mental health, right? The winter blues, let's say. If you're not getting enough sun exposure, it actually impacts how you feel. Because why? Vitamin D is a hormone. So hormones are necessary, right? Bone loss, hair loss, muscle pain, impaired healing. If you cut your skin, it doesn't heal very well. It just takes a long time. Now that could be diabetes, but it could also be vitamin D deficiency. Skin issues. This is all related to collagen, right? Collagen formation. So if you have all of this, or if you have maybe five or six of these signs and symptoms, you likely have vitamin D deficiency without even testing. Now, what are safe, effective doses for patients who can't test or don't have access to testing? Let's get right into that. Safe dosing of vitamin D. You're gonna dose with vitamin D3, 5,000 international units or 125 micrograms. You want to buffer that with vitamin K, 1,000 micrograms. It's, it's called MK4, MK7. Okay, you can take them together. Many companies actually make them in combination. You also wanna use magnesium, 200 to 400 milligrams. The reason you use magnesium is because magnesium is necessary to convert inactive vitamin D to active vitamin D when needed. So there are three forms that I personally like, magnesium citrate, glycinate, and theonate. Citrate is great for people who have bowel issues, constipation. So they don't have regular bowel movements or they go every other day, every third day. You definitely wanna use magnesium citrate for those patients. Magnesium glycinate is great for overall health and absorption, so you can use magnesium glycinate. If you have sleep issues or sleep disturbances or you have brain fog or cognitive function, I like to use magnesium L-theonate. Okay? Because these are fat-soluble vitamins and you should take them with a meal or a fatty meal, you can also use other fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin E, and vitamin A. So the fat soluble vitamin family is called DECA. D E K N A. DECA. D E K N A. Okay? So you can use other fat soluble vitamins to help improve uh, function. Now, gallbladder issues. If you have gallbladder issues, meaning you have hypothyroid or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and you have slow contraction, or a sludgy type of bile uh, function, um, you wanna use some support. Oftentimes people come in, they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and they have a sluggish gallbladder, and oftentimes they get it removed, right? And they have you know, gallbladder removed, but there's no support. So if you're taking fat-soluble vitamins or, or fatty foods, you definitely wanna support your system. Ox bile, 100 to 200 milligrams with meals, okay? Also, if you want to improve uh, vitamin D naturally, obviously you can do sunshine, 15 to 20 minutes of unprotected sun exposure. So without any sunscreen, 15 to 20 minutes a day. Now that's sometimes difficult to do, especially in the Northeast, because it's cold outside. So oftentimes people in the Northeast will run low on their vitamin D, regardless of how much sun exposure they actually have, also because of latitude. So ideally you wanna get the 15 to 20 minutes of sunshine because it has other impacts other than vitamin D. And then this is a very safe way of taking vitamin D without worrying about high levels of vitamin D or having impact on uh, calcium levels and so forth. So, Ideally, you want to check your vitamin D levels. If you want to do high doses of vitamin D, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 units, definitely get your blood levels checked before doing that, or as you go through the process, check monthly to your, so you're not exceeding the upper limits, all right? Today, we're gonna to talk about vitamin D and the prevention of autoimmune disease. There's a great study out of Boston uh, with researchers from Harvard and Brigham and Women's. 
So they did a very good study on the, uh, basically a double blind placebo study. And they had a large number of participants and the follow through was pretty good over the five years. So let's go ahead and discuss uh, what the study said. There was 25,871 participants over a five year period and it was a double blind placebo study. 12,786 men greater than or equal to the age of 50 were the participants. And then 13,085 women greater than or equal to 55 years old. Now, the participants were selected from the United States. And one of the requirements was that they were not uh, taking in more than 800 milligrams of vitamin D in food sources or supplementation. And the other requirement was that they forego fish oil supplementation. Okay, so they were not on fish oil and they were only taking 800 milligrams of vitamin D, if any, uh, or lower. Now, they split the group into four different groups. One is omega-3, a placebo, and a vitamin D placebo. So they were getting two pills with just placebos. Then you had an active group for omega-3 and an active vitamin D group. So basically they took omega-3 and vitamin D together in that group. Another group had omega-3 placebo and a vitamin D active form. And the other group had omega-3 active and a vitamin D placebo. So they were able to determine whether vitamin D and omega made an impact, or just omega, or just vitamin D, or placebo, and look at it, look at it and compare all four subsets. Now, if we just get right to it and look at the conclusion, okay, the conclusion of vitamin D supplementation with or without omega-3s for five years reduced autoimmune disease by 22%, okay? And then omega-3 supplementation with or without vitamin D reduced autoimmune disease by 15% which actually they don't consider statistically significant, but 22% is. Now, why does vitamin D impact autoimmune disease? Because there are cells, immune cells, that have rich receptors for vitamin D or the active forms of vitamin D. So vitamin D receptors are found in high density in dendritic cells, basically nerves, and then T and B cells, uh, lymph T and B lymphocyte cells, and macrophages. So when you look at it, they have high levels of receptors for the active form of vitamin D. And vitamin D, or 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, will impact the um, immune system, right? So I like to explain it as like what we call Th1 and Th2, right? Th1, and this is a very simplistic model. Th1 is when you have like an active infection, virus, bacteria, whatever it is, you have an immune response. Th2 is like the humoral response, uh, basically the memory of the infection. So they need to be in balance, okay? And there is another section where it's called T regulatory cells, and these are the referees of the two systems, trying to keep everything in balance. and Vitamin D really impacts the T regulatory cells that keeps the Th1 and Th2 systems in balance, okay? So interesting thing, they use colcalciferol, which is vitamin D3 at 200 IUs per day, okay? And the placebo was soybean oil. So they made a capsule with vitamin D and another one with soybean as a placebo for some patients. And this product was produced by Pharmavite, which makes nature-made uh, supplements or vitamins, okay? The, the reason I say that's interesting is because oftentimes when you go to your doctor and you're low on vitamin D, they uh, supplement with D2, not D3, right? So in this study, they actually used D3, and they only used 2,000 units. The marine omega-3, which they used, they used 1,000 milligrams of basically omega-3s, and of the omega-3s, EPA was 460, 
and DHA was 380. So the EPA DHA portion was actually less than the total amount, um, but this is really what's going to impact the autoimmune process. The placebo for that was olive oil. So the fish oil was produced or provided by Pronova Biopharma. They make Lavaza. A Lavaza is a prescription fish oil. It's a ethyl ester form. So basically it's been changed so it can be patented and utilized as a pharmaceutical. The more natural form would be the triglyceride forms. Now you can argue that um, Lavaza is more purified and it has more quality control, but it's also more expensive. The triglyceride forms you can get from, you know, over the counter and so forth. And there are some issues with that in terms of being rancid and not having the quality uh, or quality control that a pharmaceutical uh, grade would have. However, you can find companies that have high quality fish oil uh, that is not rancid. So it's an ethyl ester form. So even using these, you can see that it has an impact on the autoimmune process or, or the prevalence of showing up later on. Now, I like to talk about outside the study, how can we improve this even further, right? They've only used 2,000 international units of vitamin D3 to make an impact on autoimmune disease, which is 22%, right? Um, an improvement of 22%. What if they used higher doses and actually monitored um, vitamin D levels to try to get into its optimal levels? My optimal level is between 60 and 80. They did do a follow-up, a one-year follow-up, where they were giving the patients 2,000 units, and they did see an increase of somewhere around the upper 20s to around the 40 range over a year period. But what if you used higher doses and got that range up to 60 and 80, okay? Would that impact the outcome? Also, instead of using the ethyl ester form of the fish oil, what if they used the triglyceride form, which is the more natural form, right? It's not a pharmaceutical uh, changed uh, component. So what if they used a triglyceride form to impact that? Uh, would the outcome be better? And I don't know. What if they also used a younger population? Because in clinical practice, we often see autoimmune disease in, in younger and younger patients. And to prevent autoimmune disease, if you started earlier on, you can have a bigger impact. So if they also had a younger population, not over 50, uh, and did a follow-up study on that, would it make a bigger difference in terms of the outcome? Also, there are other nutrients that impact the T regulatory cells. So vitamin D is very important, ideal level 60 to 80 nanograms. And fish oil, I think, is important for that also. And the other component would be glutathione, or NAC, or NAC, right? Liposomal glutathione would be great, or NAC would also impact the T regulatory cells and probably increase the out, uh, better outcome for this study. So if they did a study and they really looked at all the nutrients that would impact the T regulatory cell or the immune cells in a positive way and used a combination of those, would the outcome be better? Uh, my guess would be yes, because we do it all the time in the office. We have patients who come in with autoimmune disease and we can put them into remission over time, uh, which is great. Um, or even thinking about prevention, right? Prevention of autoimmune disease. So mom and dad has an autoimmune disease and we have the child come in. Can we prevent them from getting autoimmune disease? It's not just about supplementation, obviously. You have to be able to reduce stress and all the different triggers of autoimmune autoimmunity, autoimmune disease. Um, you have to also look at hormonal fluctuations. You have to look at food because food has such a big impact on autoimmune disease, especially gluten and dairy. So uh, it, this was a great study because it's, it's just kind of touching the surfaces of vitamin D impacting uh, autoimmune disease. But if you combine all the things that we know, 
that can help, I think the outcome can be even better. But it's just about uh, compliance with patients and getting patients to do all these things that you want them to do, especially a large number of patients like this. Um, but this was a great study. Today we're going to talk about magnesium and vitamin D. How does it work? What does it do? And what kind of dosages should we take in order to enhance our vitamin D? Now, I've made videos on vitamin D before, as well as magnesium, so you want to go back and watch those videos. But today we're going to talk about why we would use magnesium to enhance vitamin D uh, metabolism. So let's get right into it. Vitamin D and magnesium. Magnesium assists in the activation of vitamin D. It's involved in over 300 enzymatic processes in our body, right? Magnesium is the fourth most abundant mineral behind calcium, potassium, and sodium. Now, when you look at vitamin D, there is an inactive form called 25-hydroxy vitamin D, right? In order to convert the inactive form to the active form of 125-hydroxy vitamin D, you will need magnesium because it will enhance the enzymatic processes that occur to get it to the active form of vitamin D that can be utilized. Now, when you have increased levels of 125-hydroxy or active forms of um, vitamin D in our system, it will also increase the absorption of magnesium in the GI tract. So it has a, a multi-fold effect. They're synergistic, right? They help each other. Magnesium in food is declining by over 25 to 85% compared to the 1950s. What that means is that our soil is being depleted of its nutrients, right? It should be rich in minerals and so forth. However, it's being depleted over the years due to farming practices. The most important thing here is how much do we take, right? That's the main question that a lot of people want to uh, want to know. They want to know how much should we take. So vitamin D and magnesium. So recommendations. If you're not testing for vitamin D levels, you know, it's you want to be on the lower end. If you're testing properly, you can take higher doses of vitamin D and have more of a profound effect. So my suggestion is always to test your levels of vitamin D and it's best to do it on blood work. Now, if we're not testing, I would keep it under 5,000 IUs or international units. So you can take maintenance dosages of vitamin D, two to 5,000 units per day. You can take magnesium up to two to 400 milligrams per day. Now I've used up to 1,000 milligrams of magnesium on patients. However, uh, magnesium can create loose stool, etc. So you wanna go ahead and understand how magnesium works. Like I said, I have another video on that, so you want to watch that one. So that would be a general basic recommendation. Now, in order to enhance or uh, make sure that we're not um, creating problems with calcium and so forth, you can also take K1 or K2. K1 is from plant um, extracts, and then K2 is from animal products. Also, other fat-soluble vitamins should be taken to, into consideration, vitamin E and vitamin A. Now, other considerations for absorption of vitamin D. You should take it with a fatty meal because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so it enhances absorption uh, in the GI tract. You also have to make sure your gallbladder is functioning or if you had your gallbladder removed uh, because of gallstones, etc. You can supplement with ox bile or choline, um, and there are other things you can do like milk, thistle, and so forth to enhance your gallbladder. There's a separate video on gallbladder, so you go ahead and watch that one. And now vitamin D target levels. What is our target in our blood work when we take vitamin D? Now, the lab ranges can vary from company to company. So it can be anywhere from three, uh, 30 nanograms up to 100. I say our target should be between 60 and 80 nanograms per uh, milliliter. So when you check your blood work, go ahead and look to see if you're in this target range because it's, it's very important to get your levels to a, a, a good level in order to help viral replication and enhance healing after if you do catch uh, viruses, right? 
So it's very important to do that. Today we're going to talk about vitamin D and depression. So let's get right into it. General signs and symptoms of low vitamin D include frequent illnesses, fatigue, lower back pain, general sadness or low mood, bone loss, hair loss, muscle pain or impaired healing, as well as skin issues. So we're going to focus on sadness and low mood. A study from June 2020 stated the effects of vitamin D supplements on negative emotions, a systematic and a meta-analysis. They did a meta-analysis of 25 different trials. There was over 7,000 participants, so 7,535 participants in these studies. And they did a subgroup analysis, which showed that vitamin D had an effect on patients with major depressive disorders and their subjects uh, serum vitamin D level or 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels were below or equivalent to 50 nanomoles per liter, which is equivalent to about 20 nanograms per deciliter. So usually they use uh, nanomoles uh, in outside of the United States. In the United States, they typically will use 20 nanograms or nanograms as the uh, metric. So they did this study and what they found was this. The dosage that was utilized in the studies were basically between uh, 4,000 equivalent or lower uh, IUs per day or international units per day for equal to or greater than eight weeks. The conclusion was that patients with major depressive disorders <clears throat> and individuals with vitamin D deficiency are most likely to benefit from supplementation. So what that means is that people who are depressive and have low vitamin D will benefit from vitamin D supplementation. However, low vitamin D in itself doesn't indicate that, that they have depressive disorders, okay? Supplementation recommendation. So in my office, if you're not going to test for blood levels of vitamin D or 25 hydroxy vitamin D, my recommendation is this. Vitamin D at 5,000 international units per day, which is equivalent to 125 micrograms. You take it with or right after the meal because it's a fat soluble vitamin. You can do vitamin K, 100 micrograms with meals or after the meal. And you can utilize magnesium to help better convert from your inactive to active forms. So you can use magnesium citrate. Citrate is good for people who have constipation. And you can use glycinate for general uh, body use. And if you have cognitive difficulty, sleep issues and so forth, you can utilize magnesium L-theanate. You can use between 200 and 400 milligrams per day. Uh, if you have sleep issues, I would suggest taking it maybe one hour before bed. All right, so that's the clinical study. So if you have some depressive issues and you check your vitamin D and tends to be on the low side, vitamin D supplementation might be viable for you. Okay, so I want you to guys stay happy, healthy, and wise this Thanksgiving. Do not judge others. Work on yourself and have a great Thanksgiving. Today, we're going to talk about vitamin D deficiency and growing pains. This was a study done in Turkey with about 120 children. So let's get right into the details. 120 children with growing pain. They measured 25 hydroxy vitamin D and minerals of the bone. 104 out of the 120 were vitamin D deficient. They used a single oral dose of vitamin D at very high levels actually, 150,000 international units for children under the age of six or equal to age of six, and 300,000 international units for children greater than six years old, okay? <clears throat> I believe they also added uh, 1,000 milligrams of calcium for a period of one month during the study. Growing pains, they measured 
visual analog scale, which is just a, a subjective pain scale, right? Vitamin D status. They did a pre and post supplementation. So what they did was they measured pain scale, a visual analog scale, and measured vitamin D before um, supplementing with oral vitamin D. So at the baseline, before supplementation, the average vitamin D level for those that were deficient were 13.4. Post supplementation was 44.5 at the three month mark. The visual analog scale was 6.8 and post visual analog scale was 2.9. Okay. The visual analog scale is this. You have, what is your pain level on a zero to 10? Zero being no pain, 10 being significant or severe pain. So you can see that the pain, subjective pain scale went from 6.8 dropped by more than half. And vitamin D levels went up significantly. So there is a correlation between vitamin D deficiency in pain or growing pains. And if you bring up the vitamin D levels to a higher level or a more reasonable level, uh, the bone pain starts to subside uh, quite a bit. So it's an important study. There are multiple studies on this, so go, I'll go ahead and link those below so you can read those on your own. Today we're going to talk about vitamin D deficiency leading to dementia. Last week we talked about some of the screening processes you can utilize, such as smell, to detect early onset of Alzheimer's, dementia, and even Parkinson's disease. You can utilize smells like coffee, anise, peppermint, and peanut butter in order to determine early onset. I'll go ahead and link that video below. Today we're going to talk about some studies that show there is some correlation between vitamin D deficiency and, and dementia. So let's get right into it. Dementia is one of the leading causes of disability and dependency among the older population worldwide. Globally, there's over 55 million cases of dementia, and there are probably millions of cases being diagnosed every year. The prevalence of neurocognitive dysfunction or decline has been accelerating over the years. Now, 2019, they did a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is studying different studies on vitamin D and cognitive dysfunction. And what they found is there's a significant association between vitamin D deficiency and dementia. There's a strong association when you have vitamin D levels below 10 nanograms per milliliter. There's moderate association between 10 and 20 nanograms per milliliter. Now I've done different videos on testing for vitamin D. You want to watch that one because it goes into different testing methods, right? You can do 25 hydroxy vitamin D, 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. So you want to be able to look at it and measure these levels for yourself. 2022 in Australia, they did a, uh, a pretty large study. They showed that decreased vitamin D is associated with lower brain volume and the risk of dementia and stroke. When they talk about lower brain volume, there's a uh, software that is available and some of the MRI facilities will have this software. It's called NeuroQuant. And what that software does is it looks at the volume of the brain. So they can tell you if there is uh, volume changes of different lobes of the brain as well as, as well as the cerebellum. So it can actually give you an idea of how the brain is doing uh, structurally. Now, there's also genetic analysis that supported causal effect of vitamin D deficiency and dementia. And in some population, up to 17% of dementia cases might have been prevented if their vitamin D was greater than 50 nanomoles per liter. Now, that converts to 20.03 nanograms per milliliter. Now, in certain countries, they'll use uh, nanomoles, and in the United States, they use nanograms. So what I'll do is I'll link a calculator below so you can calculate what your vitamin D level is and you can compare it to the different studies available. 
So 20.03 nanograms, that in my opinion is very low, um, but it can prevent uh, the onset of uh, Alzheimer's or dementia in a lot of patients. We like this number to be greater than 60. 60 to 80 is ideal, up to 100 usually is safe. So my recommendations for taking vitamin D is vitamin D3, 500 international, 5,000, I'm sorry, international units per day. Take it after a meal. Vitamin K2, 100 micrograms per day. Uh, also after a meal because it's a fat soluble vitamin. Magnesium will enhance this, the conversion of inactive vitamin D to active vitamin D. So you want to use magnesium, 200 to 400 milligrams per day. Now there are different forms of magnesium that you can utilize. There's magnesium citrate, helps more with bowel movements, glycinate is great for overall body function. And then there's also magnesium L-theanate, which is great for brain. So if we we're looking for brain function, we want to use magnesium L-theanate. You can also use other fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A and E. And if you have a gallbladder problem where you can't digest fat very well, right? A lot of women who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, they also have a sluggish gallbladder. So you want to be able to support the gallbladder so you can digest the fats. So I would suggest if you have gallbladder or sluggish gallbladder issues, or if you had your gallbladder removed, you can use gallbladder support, ox bile, uh, 100 to 200 milligrams after meals. So this is a simple strategy to prevent uh, early onset of Alzheimer's dementia, and it's becoming a problem worldwide, so you definitely want to take a preventative measure when once Alzheimer's and dementia gets really advanced, it's very hard to reverse. So you want to catch this really early on, right? Like the first onset, like you forget your keys a lot, you uh, start to uh, forget names, you forget to you know how to get to somewhere, uh, and you have to kind of think about it. You want to be able to catch this really early on and make the necessary changes. So I've also done a whole series on neuroinflammation, so you might want, might want to watch that one because it gives you some basics about decreasing inflammation and improving overall brain function, all right? I'm gonna make a quick video on vitamin D and the impact it will have on weight loss and strength. So let's get right into it. Vitamin D impacts waist circumference as well as muscle strength. There was a double-blind study of overweight or obese uh, patients. And what they did was they split the group and one group received 4,000 international units of vitamin D per day for a period of uh, 13 weeks. They also included resistance training for both groups. So one group is taking vitamin D and doing strength training and the other group is getting a placebo and doing strength training. So what they found was that there was a significant decrease in the hip to waist ratio for the supplemental group. So the patients who are taking vitamin D will lose more weight or change the contour of their body um, just by taking vitamin D. Increased strength in, in a period of four weeks. So they noticed a noticeable strength difference between the vitamin D group and the placebo group. So, so it's a little clinical fact, but vitamin D can help with weight loss. And so it's a little important fact for the new year if your resolution is to lose some weight. But today we're gonna to talk about vitamin D and toxicity. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, so it will accumulate in your body. I've made other videos on vitamin D and some of the questions were how prevalent is vitamin D toxicity? So let's get right into it. So vitamin D supplements are usually patient driven. That means patients go out and they buy supplements and they go, okay, um, it recommends one drop per day and they take the incorrect dosage. And over a long period of time, they can develop um, increased levels of vitamin D causing toxicity. So when you look at it, there are a 16 year retro retrospective study looking at over 73,000 people, okay? And what they did was they looked at what the levels of vitamin D were in these patients. So most people tested below 80 nanograms per milliliter. 
So that's well within the lab reference ranges. Usually 100 and below is the lab reference range. I like to see patients between 60 and 80 nanograms. However, most patients in that uh, retrospective study were below 80 nanograms. Now, most um, patients um, are within normal limits. However, there were certain populations that had elevated um, vitamin D level. And the elevation was considered over 120 nanograms per milliliter. Of those patients who had elevation, some of them, only four actually, had nausea, abdominal pain, and constipation. That means over 73,000 people they looked at, only four people actually had symptoms of vitamin D toxicity. So it's pretty rare to be overdosing on vitamin D. Now, I've seen patients personally in the office where they come in and they took the incorrect dosage. So when you look at your vitamin D uh, supplement, especially the liquid uh, form, it says one drop per day. One drop is typically 2,000 international units. So my recommendation would be two drops per day or three drops per day. But what patients misunderstand is they think, they think a drop is a dropper. So they take the whole dropper full of vitamin D for a long period of time and their vitamin D level will exceed the reference range. So I've seen people come in at 150 nanograms or 175 nanograms, and yet they still didn't actually have vitamin D toxicity symptoms. Now, that's why I always stress the fact that you should test your vitamin D levels Start from the, the baseline, what is it in the beginning, supplement, and then recheck in four weeks to see where your levels are, and then you have to determine what your maintenance dosage is going to be. Usually maintenance will be between four and 5,000 international units, but depending on your body type, how big you are, your uh, maintenance dose can go up to 10,000 international units. So that's going to be specific to each individual person so it's very important to check the levels before you supplement and then check after you supplement to try to find that fine um, zone for yourself where you're taking the right amount of vitamin D for long periods of time. Today we're going to talk about a very important topic about vitamin D or when not to take vitamin D. Oftentimes you get blanket statements of taking high doses of vitamin D to help viral replication or immune system support and so forth. However, I'm always the proponent of checking your vitamin D levels to make sure you're taking the right dosages. So let's get into the facts of why not to take high doses of vitamin D or when to be careful when taking vitamin D. So let's get right into it. When not to take vitamin D, so let's go into some of the lab markers, right? Your typical lab marker is 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And in the lab, it will say 30 to 100 nanograms per uh, milliliter. And that is measuring the inactive form of vitamin D. Now, the inactive form uh, in excess will store in your fat tissues. 125-hydroxy vitamin D the range is 19.9 to 79.3 picograms per milliliter, and that is the active form of vitamin D. And oftentimes, this form is not checked on the blood work. So the Vitamin D Council says deficiency is 0 to 40 nanograms, sufficient level is 40 to 80, and high normal is 80 to 100. Okay, so this is measuring 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now, when you get sun exposure, it triggers uh, production of vitamin D. Oral consumption, right, uh, of vitamin D, typically D2 or D3. So if you impact the skin, the vitamin D will go to the liver, there's a hydroxylation process, and then it goes to the kidney, there's another hydroxylation process, and the kidney is what produces 125 hydroxy vitamin D, or the active form of vitamin D. So, increased vitamin D levels helps to reduce the risk of certain cancers, right? 
deficient vitamin D increases the risk for autoimmune disease and is associated with hypertension and cardiovascular disease. So it's got a cardiovascular effect. It also has an immune modulating effect with autoimmune disease. Contributing factors for deficiencies in vitamin D. One is age. We're not able to convert your vitamin D or there's dysfunction in the kidney uh, and the liver where you're not producing enough of the active forms of vitamin D. Less sun exposure. Intake where you're not taking in enough vitamin D. The latitude. So if you live near the equator versus in the northeast, you're going to have different sun exposures. Complexion. So darker skinned people will tend to have uh, less production of vitamin D. That can be somewhat controversial. Uh, it's oftentimes the cholesterol in the skin that will help uh, production of vitamin D. Malabsorption syndromes, gut issues, Crohn's disease, ir uh, irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, overuse of um, uh, antacids. Liver and kidney disease, because the hydroxylation process occurs through the liver and kidney uh, for the production of active vitamin D. So when you have kidney disease, uh, it can be problematic. One clinical pearl is if you have kidney disease and your GFR is very low, uh, vitamin D uh, may not be uh, efficient, the D2 or D3. You might have to take the active form of vitamin D, which is calcitrol if you have kidney disease. Also gallbladder function. So vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, therefore you need proper gallbladder function in order to absorb fat soluble vitamins, okay? So let's get into the facts of why or when not to take extra vitamin D, okay? So let me get this here. So when not to take vitamin D? So when you have a healthy individual who comes into the office, right, and we take that healthy individual and go, we're going to check your vitamin D level. Their vitamin D level might be low, but their active form is normal. So the 125 hydroxy vitamin D is normal. So that's a healthy population. So 25 hydroxy vitamin D is very important for Im promoting immune regulation or immune modulation, right? It's kind of the referee that helps uh, the immune system. 25 hydroxy vitamin D or the active form of vitamin D activates the inflammatory response, right? It can actually increase the inflammatory response because you're increasing the immune response and T cell response, okay? Now, when you have an unhealthy individual who comes into the office or an inflamed patient who comes into the office, they might have low vitamin D, but they may have an elevated level of the active form of 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And this can be, occur because this patient might be inflamed and they're converting the inactive form to active forms at high levels to have the immune response or inflammatory response. So if you take a healthy individual, unhealthy individual here, they may have a vitamin D receptor problem or a issue with uh, receiving the vitamin D at the cells. This can occur with people who have autoimmune disease, right? These are genetic problems or polymorphisms where the vitamin D receptor is not working correctly. So sometimes you're taking a lot of vitamin D to overcome this. Another one is inflammation. The inflammatory response will suck up the inactive vitamin D, convert it to the active form to help the inflammatory response. Also with autoimmune disease, you might see this. And definitely with infections or stealth infections, even when your normal CRP or ESR is within range, right? It's not uh, elevated, but uh, you can have an issue with the vitamin D. So here's the clinical pearl, right? If you have an unhealthy individual and they have low vitamin D, that's what we checked for, let's say, and you give them 10,000 units, 15,000 units, 20,000 units of vitamin D, and the vitamin D level here does not go up. 
then you need to check for the active form of 125 hydroxy vitamin D. So you're supplementing really hard right here, but it moves very minimally or it doesn't move at all or actually drops. Then you need to check for the active form of vitamin D. And oftentimes what you'll find is an elevated active vitamin D. Uh, the reason is, it's trying to have that inflammatory response, right? It's trying to fight off the infection. However, sometimes it can promote inflammatory responses. So that, that's where you need to be careful. If you're supplementing a lot here, it doesn't go up, it's still low, or actually drops, you need to check the active form of vitamin D. Those are the patients when you do not want to give them vitamin D, right? you have to go find the underlying mechanism of why they have elevated uh, 125-hydroxy vitamin D. You have to find the inflammatory process. You have to find the autoimmune disease. You have to find the infection, right? In order to correct that problem where it's over converting to the active form of vitamin D. So those are the patients when you have to be careful not to take too, many vit too much vitamin D and you have to be careful not to perpetuate the inflammatory response. Now, what are some safe levels of taking vitamin D? 2,000 to 5,000 international units of D3 is what I recommend. You need to monitor if you're taking over 5,000 international units of vitamin D. If you're taking high levels at 10,000 and 15,000, and this does not really go up, right? The 25-hydroxy vitamin D does not go up it'll get, you have to check for the active form of vitamin D, the 125-hydroxy, because it, it can perpetuate the uh, inflammatory response. This is a very important lecture because oftentimes um, there are blanket statements from you know, commenters on, on, on YouTube videos about vitamin D and saying, oh, I should take you know, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 units of vitamin D, and my vitamin D is only 50 right? It's not going up. So you have to understand the underlying mechanisms of why that can occur and when not to take vitamin D, or you have to be monitored by someone who understands what's going on uh, to keep you at a safe level. I know there are cofactors that you should take with vitamin D. Obviously, you have to take uh, magnesium, K2, and so forth. But the purpose of this lecture is to show you that it's not a, a blanket statement that people should make when you take vitamin D of taking you know, 10,000, 20,000 units per day, all right? It's very important to understand the physiology and when something is not working is to go deeper and figure out the underlying mechanisms of why this might occur, all right? My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.